what an incredible joy it is for us to gather together and to sing about the hope of the resurrection. If you're a guest, a visitor with us this morning, we've been praying all week that you would sense the nearness of God, that God is here with us. Hear me, if he has not risen, then we should just all go home and stop this charade. You should not give one more thought to the claims of Christianity because death has proved that he is a fraud. But if he has risen, then he is the eternal king that the Bible says he is. And he is worthy of every praise, all of your adoration, your whole life lived in honor of him. And we would have every reason to celebrate Do me a favor, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 22, Psalm 22. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Take that, make it your own. That can be a gift from us to you this morning. I need you to hold your spot in Psalm 22, hold it the entire time. I'm going to reference other passages to the New Testament, but just hold your spot there in Psalm 22. Uh, By the way, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV today. Now, most of you probably know, you're familiar with particular psalms. You know that psalms are beautiful poems where God can be found in the messiness of life. That life is full of circumstance and trial, but God can be found and God is near in many of those. You may have a piece of art in your home or a coffee mug, a t-shirt with some of your favorite psalms. Uh, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after you, God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Maybe you've been at a funeral and heard Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know that in the messiness that, that that poetry, you realize God is near. Now, you may not know that the Psalms also are to be read with the larger narrative as a whole, telling the story. In fact, the New Testament quotes more than any other book, the book of Psalms about predictions of the coming king. That God had written down hundreds, even a thousand years prior to the coming of his son and predicted the coming of his son. The book of Psalms is like a symphony that God has poetically prophesied details about Jesus' death and resurrection. Like a mystery novel that once you know the ending, once you go back and you reread it, suddenly you realize that the author has written in details that are too magnificent, too grand. You're like, he was pointing to him all along. Friend, I have something exciting, something magnificent to show you this morning, how God predicted in stunning detail a thousand years before the coming of Jesus his crucifixion and resurrection. I will show you details of the crucifixion, okay, 700 years before a crucifixion had ever been invented. But before we get there, I have a question for you. That is, if God stirs in your heart this morning, if God meets us in his word, and his Holy Spirit pulls back the veil, and you are allowed to see something magnificent. You are allowed to know that God is near. He is not far away. Will you respond? Will you respond? If God shows you that he is near today, will you respond? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you. We have gathered to hear from you, to sing and to lift high the name of Jesus. 
God, we need your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, to kindle afresh magnificent truths of who you are, that, that Jesus rose from the dead, and that that life can be in us. Would you do what only you can do this morning? We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. In this symphatic movement of the psalm, Psalm 15 to 24 work as a cohesive unit. And they frame the question, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in God's holy presence? That question is asked in 15 and 24, framing it up. It's a poetic question, asking Who is able to enter into the presence of the Almighty God? Who even dare come close to his holy throne? In plain language, who can go to heaven? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I'd say it's a pretty important question because, friend, in your strength, you might get 70 years, maybe 80 Are you going to heaven? Well, the Psalms right here, they give an immediate answer. Only those who are pure in heart, who have never slandered with their tongue, think for a moment about what you've said, have never done evil to their neighbor, are generous, kind, the perfect friend, and only those who are absolutely spotless. Now, friend, let me stop you right there. Don't flatter yourself. You don't have clean hands and a pure heart. You might be better than 10 of your neighbors, but this isn't Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood Award. This is can you stand before the one who is perfect in all of his ways and dwells in unapproachable light. The Bible says that if you break even one of God's commandments, you are held as if you have broken the whole. Now, the good news for all of us is that there in the Psalms, a perfect king is introduced. Psalm 18, 20, and 21. He is a picture of the one, the one who can ascend to the hill of the Lord into God's presence because he is perfect in all of his ways. Jesus is the only person to ever live who has never sinned, not even one time, not Muhammad, not Buddha, nor anyone else. The Bible says that Jesus always obeyed the Father, that he only spoke what God wanted him to say. Think about that claim. Only speak what God says? But suddenly there's a twist in the plot. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? The perfect king is introduced, but suddenly there is a twist because the perfect king is in distress, surrounded by enemies, and God is distant. He has forsaken the cries of the anointed king. Guys, this is the context and the scene of Psalm 22. And I want to show you a certain level of detail predicted a thousand years before the coming of Jesus. I'm going to read for you sections of Psalm 22 and then sections of the New Testament. And then afterwards, we have to ask the question, why is God so distant Why would the perfect king cry out and say that he has been forsaken? So look with me in your Bibles at at Psalm 22. Because as the scene opens, the king has loud cries of despair. He is surrounded by his enemies. They are a gang of evildoers. That in verses 12 and 13 and 20 and 21 are described as a pack of wild animals who are ready to devour. The lions have opened their mouth and the king is in the clutches of death. 
From his surrounded position, the encircled king exclaims, listen to verses seven and eight. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads, saying, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let him rescue him since he delights in him. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now back in Psalm 22, look at verse 18. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. John 19, 23 through 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his outer garment and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece. And so they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill scripture. They divided my outer garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Now, before I read to you verses 14 through 18, I need to describe to you in detail the horrors of crucifixion. If you are a Christian here this morning, undoubtedly you will be moved by emotions as you pause and consider that this is what Jesus endured for you. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians in 300 BC and perfected by the Romans in 100 BC. It was intended to be the most painful death ever invented. It's where we get our term excruciating. The offender would be stripped completely naked and then forced to lie down on the crossbeam as nine inch nails are driven through the hands or the wrist to hold him up there. The legs are then placed together, but they are bent in a 45 degree angle. The whole purpose is that this would be an atomically impossible position for a person to endure. If you've ever in gym class had to stand against a wall and make a chair, you know that within just minutes, your legs will give out. They cannot hold your weight. And in a short period of time, your thighs and your calves will cramp and give out. When they give out and all the weight is on the arms, the shoulders were within seconds dislocate, soon followed by the elbow and the wrist. The arm is actually nine inches longer than normal. Once everything is dislocated, the full weight and force of the body as it slumps is pressed into the pectoral muscles and into the rib cage. And those muscles can only hold for a fraction. And then suddenly the lungs are forced open in full expansion. Take a deep breath right now and hold it. Now imagine not being able to exhale. The only way the victim on the cross can exhale is to push off the legs, to work themselves up so that the, the rib cage can close and they can exhale. This is the way that breathing has to occur. In fact, the entire time the, the, the victim is active, moving up and down 12 inches for every breath that they have to take. And so now the scene is set and hours start to pass. Within minutes, Jesus is short of breath. The nerves in his wrists and his feet are screaming. He's covered in blood and sweat, terrorized by imminent death. He knows he's going to suffocate to death. Within hours, catastrophic failure was set in. 
Remember, he's not getting adequate air with each breath. The CO2 levels in his blood starts to rise. This causes the heart to beat faster in order to pump blood through the body. The brain sends the message, breathe faster, and Jesus begins to pant. The body demands more air, meaning more excruciating movements up and down the cross, all to the delight of the crowd. As hours go by, there's too little oxygen, too much CO2. The heart beats faster and faster, reaching 220 beats a minute. Jesus is already bleeding from the scourging, the crown of thorns, the nails. He's dehydrated. He goes into first degree shock. About noon, his heart begins to fail. His lungs begin to be filled with pulmonary fluid. It's a race. Which one is going to give out first, his heart, or is he going to suffocate to death? Sometimes it took people days to die of crucifixion, and they would break the victim's legs in order to speed up the process. But Jesus has been scourged twice. He will only hang for six hours. And as the fluid surrounded Jesus' heart, it came underneath so much pressure, it literally burst. That was his cause of death. 700 years before crucifixion was ever invented, in your Bible, preserved for you, Psalm 22, listen as I read verses 14 through 18. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare at me, and they gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them. And cast lots for my garments. You see, our perfect king has died. As verse 15 says, you lay me in the dust of death. But why? Why? How can this be? The only one able to ascend the hill of the Lord. How could he die? How could he be forsaken? Everyone fears rejection, isolation, being cast off. I remember the day that Lane, my wife, took Eli to kindergarten for the first time and dropped him off. She came home and she entered through the back door with tears in her eyes. And I smiled. I thought maybe she's being pretty sentimental. But she shared with me with a quiver in her voice she said, I held his hand, and he was shaking. You know, as a parent, your heart longs for protection. You know how cruel the world can be, what it feels like to be rejected, isolated, cast off. And right there in that moment, her and I, we just began to pray, God, would you be near to my son? Would you protect him? Why would God be so distant in this moment of crisis from his own son? Look at verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night. I find no rest. Friend, Jesus cried those very words from the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer, my friend, is the greatest news ever told. That God's distance God's not saving his son is because Jesus had become the curse of your sin. 
Now, I don't want to in any way suggest a breaking of the Trinity, but in an incredible way, magnificent beyond our comprehension, Jesus' association with our curse of sin had him cry out, why have you forsaken me? Deuteronomy 21, 23, God's word has already told us, cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. The Jews knew this. It's why they crucified him outside the city walls of Jerusalem. They didn't want Jerusalem to become a curse or unclean. Do you actually know that repeatedly, more than four times throughout the New Testament, the apostles call attention to Jesus hanging on a tree. They could have used the word cross, but instead they intentionally say he hung on a tree, reminding you that Jesus had become the curse of your sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin. Every wicked thought Every hurtful word, all of your shame. And there he hung, forsaken. The crucified king is dead, hopelessness in the air. But gather around because I have good news to share. Because early Sunday morning, at the break of dawn, the crucified king got up. He got up. He was resurrected from the dead. And the women who went to the tomb that morning to prepare his body with oils and spices, they found him alive. And he appeared to the 12 apostles multiple times. He appeared to James, his brother, who is a skeptic who didn't believe and suddenly becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He appeared to, to groups of his disciples at one point, more than 500. And his final appearance, he appeared before his apostles and they saw him ride the clouds ascending into heaven. He got up. He got up. The disciples were radically changed from fearful to courageous. They would lay down their lives, willing to die to tell others that Jesus had risen from the dead. And still to this day, the resurrection of Jesus is one of the most historically reliable facts in all of history. He is risen. He is risen indeed. But you ask, where is the resurrection in the Psalms? Well, I'm glad you asked. Psalm 23, probably the most famous piece of poetry in the history of the world. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23 is placed right next to Psalm 22 and is a picture of the resurrected king in paradise. No longer in the jaws of death, the king lies down in peace. In Psalm 22, God is distant, but the very center of Psalm 23 is the phrase, you are with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. No longer surrounded by enemies in Psalm 23, God has prepared a festive table in the presence of his enemies. And look at verse three. You've probably heard it. He restores my soul. Guys, the literal translation is he restores my life. Because soul at the very end of 22 verse 29, it says he who could not keep his soul alive has now in, burn, in verse three been restored to life. He is resurrected. Now, maybe you think I'm making too much of this, but there's a parallel passage in Psalm 16 verse 10. And it says this, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Because written 
in veiled poetry, the symphony of God's own son, the perfect king, forsaken, crucified, and resurrected from the dead. It's magnificent. It's been preserved for you, written a thousand years ahead of time, all framed within the question, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Can I speak to you plainly? This is the most important question I could ever ask. Do you know that you're going to heaven? The Bible says that there is a book in heaven that has your name on it, and written inside is every sin you've ever committed. Because God is holy, he must hold every sin accountable. Every thought, every word you've ever spoken, everything you've ever done. And at the end of time, that book will be open and you will stand before the judge and the charges will be read. Friend, if there is even one sin in your book, you are guilty of it all. But the reality is, you can't go one day without sinning. There are thousands upon thousands of sins if you stand before a holy God. But God, in his love and mercy for you, sent his son who lived his entire life to perfection. Not even one time did he disobey. He only spoke what God wanted. His book is filled with nothing but righteousness. And in his love for you, at the end of Jesus's life, when he was nailed to the cross, he took your sins. And the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin. On your behalf, so that you could become the righteousness of God in him. It's an exchange of accounts. Guys, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I spend my whole life doing this. Listen to me. On judgment day, my only hope, my only trust is that Jesus Christ has switched accounts for me. That's it. Nothing of my own. This is the good news that he has taken it all and in exchange gives me his perfection, his righteousness. Guys, this is how you're saved. So I have a question. How do you switch books? How do you switch accounts? Do you have to run to the top of a mountain and then when you get there, Jesus, all right, all right, you're serious. I'll switch with you. No. No. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. It's a free gift by faith. But hear me, there's one condition. You see, whether you know it or not, when you sin, you are declaring that you are the king. And so Jesus is willing to give you his book of perfection, but the requirement is that you would not only believe, but that you would repent by faith. That is that you would kneel and that you would take off that crown and you would lay it at the foot of the cross, that you would declare that Jesus is the king. Friend, what would it mean if Jesus became the king of your life? This is the offer right now. Remember at the beginning, if God is near, if God has long written down more than a thousand years wooing you, sending his son, dying in your place, it is for this very moment, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Is his account credited towards you? And have you kneeled 
and repented and declared him your king. With every head bow and every eye closed, If you do not know that you're saved, would you right now in the quietness of your heart, would you cry out? Would you declare to God, I have no hope besides Jesus? If you were to judge me according to my book, it is filled with sins and I am separated from you. But I have heard good news that you love me and you gave your son. And I ask you right now, would you forgive my sins? And I kneel and I take the crown and I give it to you, King Jesus. And I will follow you the rest of my life if you help me. I love you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.